So uh, good evening. Thank you um, very much for inviting me, and uh, thank you for having me here while uh, um, I seat while you're finishing your dinner. So, so my my task was uh, really to uh, to set the stage for uh, my uh, good colleague uh, Dean Yan, who, who will be speaking about uh, more specifically about some things that are going on in Hong Kong. And um, I, I want to talk about cities. I want to talk about, uh, about cities, and really to give you a um, a framing about how we can think about cities and how we can think about cities and how they affect health. And uh, really, this seems opposite to talk about this in uh, Hong Kong, which is truly one of the world's um, global cities. And as you'll see in a second, representing very much where cities are headed overall. So that's really my agenda. I'm just going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes. And uh, I call this sort of maximizing human potential in urban areas because it seems to me like given the importance of cities, if we are to create healthy people as healthy as possible, we need to align cities with our health. So cities are the present and the future. And I think we should not make a mistake about that. I think sometimes we talk about cities as though they are something that's coming. But cities are very much the present. The future is going to have more and more cities. There's no question about this. That we are headed ever more in a direction where cities matter more for humans, for human potential, and for human health. This is just the, perhaps the simplest way of showing this. This is from uh, United Nations data. The green line are number of people living in cities. The red line are number of people living in rural areas. So what you see is that we had a flip over about 10 years ago where more people in the world were living in cities than were living in rural areas. And then what you see is this exponential increase. So rural areas, number of people living in non-urban areas has flattened and slowly going down, while number of people living in the cities is exponentially going up. By 2050, we're going to have almost 40% more people worldwide living in cities than are living in rural areas. And you know, th this has enormous implications for how we structure our societies, because it says that we need to wrap our brain around how we can build cities that allow us to flourish. And now, now you all in Hong Kong, and when I say something like that in Hong Kong, I fear that you're all shrugging and thinking, well, it's obvious, of course, that we, we build cities to, to help us flourish. But we should remember that urban living is a relatively new to the human condition. In 1800, which is not so long ago in human lifespan, 5% of the world's population lived in cities. So we are now at 2050, having almost twice as many people living in cities as living in rural areas. So from, from the point of view of the human trajectory, we as a species are really just beginning to learn how to live in cities and beginning to learn how to deal with the complex sort of forces that come about when you squeeze so many people together in a small space, which ultimately is what cities are, something that you in Hong Kong all know intimately well. Just to give you a sense, just spatially, of the galloping urbanization this is a map of the world, and uh, the, the dark blue countries are countries where at least half the population is uh, living in cities. So all I want you to do is just go through time, 1960, 1980, 2000, 2020, and 2050, where you see that by 2050, with a couple of exceptions of countries in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, all countries will have at least half the population living in cities. Now. When I talk about cities, I, I, um, I must admit this is my favorite place to talk about cities because if you are to talk about cities, you should talk about cities in Asia because insofar as cities are going to matter for the entire human species, it is not going to matter anywhere more than it does in Asia. Why? Well, because this is actually where people in cities are. So this goes back to the original graph. The green line is urban populations in Asia. So you can see that Urban populations in Asia are going to be about, by 2050, about 60% of the world's urban population. So uh, when I, I tell my students is, if you're interested in studying cities, and studying cities and how they're related to health, you have to understand cities in Asia. There's no other way, no other choice. The second part of the world after Asia, which really matters in terms of cities, by the way, is Africa, which is the red bar, which I'm actually highlighting that because I think in our minds, in, in our global minds, we have accepted that Asian cities are a thing, 
we have a harder time wrapping our brain around the fact that African cities are a thing. But Africa is the second region which has the biggest number of cities. And you know, when, when I speak to North American audiences, I make the point that the cities of romantic comedies, you know, which is sort of New York and Paris and London, they don't matter so much anymore. What really matters in terms of cities as population centers are cities here and secondary cities in Africa. And I'll show you that. Um, the other thing about cities is uh, that's happening is that we're also developing these very large, sprawling mega cities. And, uh, and, and we're seeing more and more of them around the world. And all I want you to see here, this is Tokyo. This was 1972, and this is Tokyo today. The red was what it was 1972. The yellow is the spread today. This is just over the past 50 years. And this is Mexico City. Again, the red becomes the yellow to give you a sense of how some of these large cities have been growing bigger and bigger. And these large cities have really become enormous local, national, and global poles. They really have come to dominate cultural, commercial, intellectual life. And as a result, set norms and set ways of being and behaviors that determine the extent to which and how human beings flourish. So these are the 10 largest cities in the world, um, uh, which uh, start with Shanghai, Beijing, you have Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Karachi, Mumbai, Kinshasa, Moscow, Sao Paulo. As you see, five of those are in Asia. Those 10 largest cities in the world are larger, the total population of the 10 largest cities in the world is larger than the population of all those countries in blue. So the 10 largest cities in the world, their population combined is larger than all but 15 countries in the world. Which, if you stop and think about it, is pretty remarkable. So if you're thinking about the health of populations, as I do, as uh, Gabriel does, you have to think about the health of urban populations, because that is where populations are. So if we're interested in creating healthy people, we have to think about healthy people in cities and the implications of living in cities for our lives. This is the United States. The red is New York City. New York City is, the, is our largest city in the US. The population of New York City is larger than 38 American states. So, so those of you who follow things like sort of uh, American politics, you'll know we have 50 states and you know, we have elections and there's a lot of conversation about number of states that go one party versus another. But 38 of those states are smaller than New York City. New York City always votes the same way, by the way. So uh, it uh, really gives you a sense of how the national politics are end up being distorted by decisions made about representation around the country when in fact populations are concentrated in, in, in particular areas. Um, these are the five largest cities in the world and I, I just want to just show you quickly the, the eastern spread of cities. So in 1950, the five largest cities in the world were New York, Paris, London, Tokyo and Osaka. This is what I call sort of very much the, the romantic comedy view of cities because, because the um, romantic comedies remain stuck on these cities. But that was actually 1950. 1975, you have New York, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Osaka, Tokyo. By 2000, it had become Tokyo, Osaka, Mexico City, New York, Sao Paulo, still. 2025, now the five largest cities are Tokyo, Shanghai, Dhaka, Delhi, and Cairo. So, an enormous shift eastward. Now, you think about health. So the question is, how do you then think about how cities create health and how cities allow us to flourish? And for those of you who want to dip their toes into the academic well, there are countless numbers of papers that talk and create complex models and ways of thinking about how cities affect health. I have written some of them. Um, but I actually think at the end of the day, it comes down to, th to three really simple concepts. And I think there are some very simple concepts that one can organize in our thinking to understand how cities affect health. The first one is what I call the social environment. So cities are places that concentrate people together. When you concentrate people together, what you end up happening is you have people interacting in a much more defined, finite space than we used to interact. 
which means our social spaces become much more proximal and they determine much more how we behave and what we experience. So thinking about the social environment really tells us how we can think about cities and cities and health. One of the biggest elements of the social environment is the aging of the population. So this is looking around the room, not all of you, maybe half the room. When you were in high school, you learned things about population pyramids. This is a classic population pyramid, women and men, more young people. That was 1970. The population pyramid, in the context of cities, particularly in the context of Asian cities, no longer exists. Because going quickly in time, that's 1990, that's 2010, that's 2030, and that's 2050. We now have population barrels. So we used to have this pyramid, more people at a young age, that old people now really have similar number of people. And when you look at some countries, this actually is this, this uh, barrel is inverted and you have more people at the older ages. This has enormous implications for changing the social environment in, the, in the cities. It doesn't create challenges, it creates challenges and opportunities. But it certainly changes everything about how we think about cities and the social environment within cities. This is the proportion of the world's population age 60 or older by country. That was 2015, the darker the color, more people age 60 or older. This is 2050, and you can see what's happening again with uh, Asia as well as Europe, with more and more people being over 60. One of the, in the elements of this, one of the key elements of this, is that the aging of populations, in particularly in economies that have boomed in the past couple of decades, has happened much faster than in older economies, like where I live. So just to give you a sense of this, this is one of my favorite sort of uh, piece of data. The number of years it took for the population of over 65 to double from 7% to 14%. So it took France 115 years to go from having a population of uh, a 7% population at 65 plus to 14%. That's how long it took France. It took South Korea 18 years. It took Japan 26 years. It took Singapore only 19 years. So, um, and when you look at uh, China, China again is 26 years, Thailand is 22 years. So France and many other European countries had a century to adjust to going from 7% of the population being over 65 to 14% of the population being over 65. While Asian countries essentially had one to two decades to make that adjustment. That is an enormous shift. That is an enormous shift in the social environment. It's an enormous shift in the interrelations and the social fabric that shape our day-to-day -day life. A large part of that come issues of social interactions and social isolation. Now, when we tend to think of social isolation, we tend to think of it as sort of an abstract concept. I suspect if I were to ask, everybody has a sense that, well, it's not such a good thing, social isolation. We seldom recognize the extent to which it is not a good thing. So all of what you see here in this, in this graph is look at this bar and look at this bar. This simply says risk for mortality. This is social, social isolation. This is smoking. So social isolation has an effect that's actually greater than the effect of smoking. So in rapidly urbanizing populations, which are rapidly aging, forces of social isolation, which, which inevitably are arising when you have such rapidly aging populations, become critical to understanding health and flourishing. So this is the social environment. And I could say a lot more about social environment, but I'm going to leave that to Dean Young, who's going to talk a little bit more about this, because there are issues then about um, social compact, social cohesion, and what that means in times of civil unrest obviously fits in under social environment. Let me talk about physical environment for a second. Physical environment. The physical environment is the world around us. It's the world that we build within which we live. And the physical environment both creates our opportunities and constrains our opportunities for health. Housing is one classic example. And I started with housing because I know that this is a challenge here in Hong Kong. 
There is abundant data. I could spend 20 minutes just quickly going through data about how housing is associated with health. And how we've always known that housing is associated with health, but in some respects, the science is behind how rapidly the housing landscape is changing. The science is behind how rapidly the availability, issues of availability of housing, availability of standard housing, availability of sufficient housing is changing. So for example, there's just one data point that your rehabilitated housing is double the proportion of adults who actually have excellent health. And th 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 there are plenty of data like this. Pollution, which is directly linked to our built environment. Uh, about 7 million deaths from pollution worldwide. About half of those are due to indoor pollution. About half of those are due to outdoor pollution. That is directly linked to how we build our cities, how we structure our cities, and how we structure transportation in our cities. Um, this is um, uh, looks at um, a map of China and looks at uh, uh, natural disasters. Cities tend to be built in um, on water, and cities built on water represent opportunity for natural disasters. And there has been an increase in natural disasters over the past 25 years, an increase in number of people who are affected by these disasters, and an increase in economic costs. And the reason for this increase is driven by two factors. One is a combination of global environmental climate change that is resulting in a lot more hydrological aberrances, coupled with growth in cities. So we are having more disruption in the climate, more disruption than that comes with shores and water, and we're putting more and more people in that in, in these places. And this is something that we actually need to consider. If we're thinking about cities, we're thinking about the health of cities, um, one has to bear this in mind. So I talked about social environment, talked about physical environment, and in both of these areas, I could go on and on. I could really talk, talk a lot more about each of them, but I really just want to give you a flavor, just to give you a, a framing for how to think about cities. But I want to talk about a third topic, which in some respects has overlapped with the previous two topics, but I thought it was important to just to highlight it. And this is the issue of variability within cities and poverty. The slide, by the way, the picture here is uh, from uh, an artist from uh, South Africa, um, uh, who um, you may have seen some of his work. This is a picture of Johannesburg taken from above. And uh, his work is actually quite remarkable because uh, he shows the natural divide between high income and low income communities. That's sort of uh, what illustrates his work. One of our challenges, and by us, if I may, I mean people sitting in this room having uh, dinner, is that uh, we are all on the left side of the divide, and that we seldom talk to people on the right side of the divide. The other challenge is that we, on the left side of the divide, are a minority. When I look at America, I'll give you American data. In America, about 20 to 25 percent of people graduate from college. Graduating from college is become pretty clearly the marker between financial stability, not financial stability, between good health and bad health. Which means that really, from a health perspective, the country is divided into 20% versus 80%. And that proportion is reflected in our city. This is um, Detroit, which is um, one of the American cities. And uh, this is from a study that uh, was able to take everybody in the American census and geocode them. And uh, you have the blue dots are white, the green dots are black. The line in the middle is the road called Eight Mile. It actually became a movie which was made with the rap star Eminem. But all I want to show you is the extraordinary divide, the extraordinary segregation, you see? Essentially, Everybody on one side of the street is white. Everybody on the other side of the street is black. And, and, and you see these patterns, these patterns of segregation, of group segregation in cities all over the world. And as cities grow, we're going to see more and more of the segregation. This is Boston, where I live. And uh, I, this is from a study that we had done. And I'm showing you the picture of the Boston subway. That's the Boston subway. Those are those, where those colored lines are. And what we did is we simply mapped out the burden of diabetes by Boston subway stops. And uh, see over here, this is the Arlington and Fenway stops. 
prevalence of diabetes is about 2 to 3 percent. Maverick Dudley Square, 11 percent. There is a five fold difference in diabetes burden within two to three miles of each other on different subway stops in Boston. Now, I don't know what the data are in Hong Kong, but I bet you'll find the exact same pattern. So there is enormous variability, and that variability is patterned on socioeconomic markers, principally poverty. And we're seeing this more and more in cities around the world. As cities grow, as city social environment changes, city physical environment changes, we are creating sharp segregation lines between haves and have-nots within cities. And that is going to color everything that happens within cities, including, including tears in the social fabric as, as you're seeing happening in Hong Kong right now. Um, and high poverty urban neighborhoods are persisting and growing. So one of the images of cities, for better or for worse, is this. You look outside at sort of the gleaming offices. That is our image of cities. That image of cities forgets the fact that the majority of dwellers of large, rapidly growing cities are not living like this. They're actually living in urban, in high poverty urban neighborhoods. And what this shows, this is uh, American data, 1970 versus 2000, you see um, many more high poverty urban neighborhoods than we used to have. And remember that sprawl I showed you with Mexico City and uh, Tokyo when I showed you how cities have grown? That's what's happening. That as cities grow, you are accumulating other neighborhoods, and many of these neighborhoods are high poverty neighborhoods. So when we think about cities, it is we need to do a cognitive restructuring and say these are places of tremendous opportunity, places where we're concentrating people, places where people are aging and living longer, but also places of enormous variability between people where there are real pockets of poverty. Um, this is um, from um, a, uh, an analysis that uh, re recently was done for a book that I did, which I'll show you in a second, showing the spread of um, between rich and poor in American cities growing. To make it much too simple. So let me conclude. I want to conclude now by talking about health and uh, just a couple of notes about health. As the world urbanizes, the world is also getting healthier. And much of that health is due to the fact that we are living more in cities. Cities ultimately represent a, a progression of our capacity as humans to achieve the infrastructure that generates health, to be in healthier social environments, healthier physical environments. This is actually one of my favorite slides on this. This is from a, a, a paper about China. And uh, what this says here, over here, is more people living in cities, and there is life expectancy. And all I want you to see is that this line goes up. You see that? Which means more people in cities, more people are living longer. But what's interesting about this picture is this. I'm going to go back now to high school math for everybody. Look at the slope of this line and the slope of that line. The green line is 2005. The pink line is 1990. The slope of the line is getting steeper over time, which means the more urbanized cities are getting, they're getting healthier and healthier. So cities are becoming more important for people's health, not less important. So this is good news. This is good news. But it ultimately depends on the opportunity to combine healthy social environment, healthy physical environment, and to deal with growing inequality and heterogeneity within these cities. This is um, the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is ultimately the global community's commitment to improving itself over the coming decades. This replaced something which is called the Millennium Development Goals. And I'm, I'm concluding with this because I want to show you that the, our, the goals, the social development goals, some things like gender, like gender equality, quality education, um, um, zero hunger, no poverty, these all ultimately are affected by and affect cities. So the global community's commitment to trying to improve global health, the health of global populations, and to my mind, is inextricably linked with health in cities. Um, one of uh, my latest books was a book on the health in cities, which I presume is why I was asked here to speak about health in cities. Um, uh, this is the book, Catherine Atkins, one of the um, editors was here with me. And uh, we thought that uh, it was important enough to recognize that the growth in cities is happening in Asia, that actually the picture on the cover is Hong Kong. That actually, uh, is, uh, is, is, and if anybody's interested in this, 
there is quite a bit more depth in the book on uh, this is not a this is not a light bedtime read, but uh, there are many chapters that uh, you can skim that talk about these issues. That's all. Thank you very much for that.